Molly was a bag on a stick? Slugs breathe through holes in their side? Find out more about the biology of Discovery Season 3, Episode 1, starting now. Welcome to BioTrekkie with the Admiral. My name is Mohammed Noor. I'm a biology professor at Duke University, and I'm an occasional science consultant for the Star Trek universe. I am here with my co-host, the amazing Jane Brooke. Hello, I'm Jane Brooke. I played Admiral Katrina Cornwell for the first two seasons of, um, of Discovery, and I am here now as Mohammed's friend and a science student. Uh, someone who's going to ask Mohammed questions as he takes us through some of the science in the Discovery Season 3 episodes. So to start with Episode 1 of Season 3, Mohammed, what are, as I was watching it, I was curious to know, what are, let's say, let's say three things that in particular that jumped out at you as you were watching Episode 1 um, on a scientific level? Thank you. Um, well, I love the episode. I'll start by saying that first thing that I thought was it was really fun in this episode to see a lot of familiar Star Trek aliens that we've seen in, uh, in other series. And we're 900 years in the future, but we still see Orions, we see Andorians, we see Lurians. That's the species that Morn was from Deep Space Nine. He was among the people there. So that was pretty cool. Um, I was even more excited, as usual, to see non-humanoid aliens, something we don't see enough of in Star Trek, I think. Uh, not referring just to our little friend Grudge, <laughs> but also to that giant transform Molly. That, that provides a lot of opportunity for creativity. I had a lot of thoughts on the biology of that transform and how, you know, how it lives and things like that. Um, final little piece, something that I thought was kind of cool, I actually didn't even catch it the very first time through, was the smaller insect-like animals at the very beginning of the episode. I thought they were kind of interesting. It was fun to think about like, whoa, what would that look like? I mean, again, it's not something we see very often in Star Trek, so. Well, that's cool. So let's, let's go back to those uh, three points and sure. break it down a little bit. So in terms of the humanoids that we meet in space, you know, when I watch it and think about it, it makes sense to me on a production level and on a storytelling level. So not even thinking of the science, I'm thinking, you know, this franchise started in the 60s when computer generated imagery wasn't um, advanced and CGI has always been very expensive, you know, no matter when it's been done. So it makes sense to use human actors um, to tell the stories. You could add makeup and you're off to the races. But also thinking about it, to me, it seemed like from a storytelling viewpoint, uh, it makes sense. I'm not sure that this franchise would have lasted as long as it has if it had only had uh, creatures that were totally unrecognizable to us. There's something about having the humanoid creatures that help the writers tell stories that um, really hook the audience. So from the production and the storytelling point of view, I totally get it. But my question for you on a science level is tell us what you think about the um, possibility of meeting so many different humanoid type creatures in space. And um, has this franchise in any of its series explained to us uh, how that can be? That's a great set of questions. So on the first part of the question of like, are we likely to meet humanoids from other worlds? Uh, really not, <laughs> not so much <laughs> at all. <laughs> <laughs> There's one exception to that. The one way that we could see something that looks like something that looks a lot like something on Earth, you know, so, something that's humanoid, but maybe not quite human, would be is if it's actually related to some life on Earth. So, for example, closely related to us. And it would have to be closely related. It can't be something that, oh, shares a common ancestor with us four billion years ago. That's, that's way too far back to have humanoids show up again. So that's not very likely. But if it's something, for example, let's say humanoids were taken from Earth, say a couple hundred thousand years ago. So something like Homo erectus, you know, that was around a couple hundred, uh, a couple hundred thousand years ago. It was taken to some other world. It was given enough things that it could live on some other world. Maybe then it would get, you know, rumpled forehead or pointed ears or some of the things that we tend to see in other Star Trek series. So that explanation would work. Now on your second question, has Star Trek addressed this? They actually did a couple of times, sometimes uh, very accurately is sometimes with heroic efforts, but maybe not 100% successful. So the most famous example is from the next generation, uh, an episode called The Chase. 
And that is one where they suggested that all the humanoids are related to each other, but back to that origin of life. So the idea there was put out of source panspermia, that life was seeded on Earth and Romulus and Cardassia Prime and all the familiar Star Trek worlds that we tend to hear about. Uh, and then somehow evolution was directed to a form that led to us. That doesn't really make sense. That's way too far because it doesn't consider the possibility of, even if you had exactly the same environment throughout, which you wouldn't have, <laughs> but even if you did, it doesn't consider the role of chance events. Right. There's big oh. chance events that pay, played a big role in our formation. So just one example I always like to give, uh, if you think about 65 million years ago, Earth you know, was covered with dinosaurs. We had that asteroid impact to Mexico, which you know, knocked back the dinosaurs along with volcanic activity at the time. Did that happen on Romulus too? Did that happen on Cardassia Prime too? These, these sort of random chance events were really necessary for you know, mammals to become abundant, which obviously led to humanoids becoming abundant. Now, there was one episode of Star Trek, the original series called the Paradise Syndrome, and they suggested an alien species called the Preservers went to various plants and picked up individuals and brought them to other worlds. So that would be something much more recent. That works fine. I mean, there's no barrier to that. The one thing that you would find then, which would be kind of interesting, is that, you know, although we're related genetically to all species on Earth, which, you know, I applaud the Star Trek writers for always acknowledging that fact. Um, if you had other species on Romulus or on Cardassia Prime, unless they were also taken from Earth, then presumably they're not related to the Cardassians or to the Romulans. So it's kind of an interesting. Act. That is such a great explanation, because when you started the explanation, I was filing another question away in my head because ah. you were saying, um, but you explained it. You were saying uh, if if it is that we're all related, you know, four billion years ago, that doesn't make any sense. And my person on the street is like, well, yes, it does. Why not? <laughs> but this idea of chance events, yeah. and this idea, and actually your answer is sort of like profoundly metaphorical for each individual life because you can take identical twins, you can oh, take yeah. kids in the same family. I mean, you know, it becomes yeah. a metaphor for life that. Um, that's a great point. People, I never thought of that, you know, but you're exactly people right. People can start out in the same way. And then, you know, one person has a car accident or the other person has, you know, whatever. Exactly. A, sci a scientist for a parent who can explain <laughs> things to them and they go into science or whatever, you know, like there's chance. So that that is very interesting because as a person on the street, I would have thought, well, that explains it. All these little biological bits just in the big bang went everywhere and we ended up with humanoids but interesting that that would not be possible i, lo I love your your comment about families i hadn't thought of that before but it's true i guess it's the same as identical twins i mean that you know once they're born that's it i mean they still have the genetic similarity and they're starting at the same point but from there it's all it's a separate they it's can a separate go trajectory. very different tra but but the thing that's interesting is that they can also really relate to each other yes. like we find yeah. in star trek you know yeah. uh, which goes to my storytelling point yeah. that um you know, like I had scenes with Mary Chifo, who's a Klingon, and she's humanoid. So we were able to have moments together, even though I'm human, she's Klingon, um, that felt very profound, uh, even though it was crossed. Wonderfully done, too. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So, oh, that, okay, so that answers the humanoid question. So now, to negate everything I said about storytelling <laughs> and, um, and the fact that we need to relate to humanoids to last for 50 years, we have Molly, who... Okay. Now, I have to credit the writers in not only... But since we're talking about Molly, I'll talk about Molly, but also, you know, they're writers, so they pick their names and their words and their place names very carefully and very, um, very strategically and, and in a meaningful way. So when you when you name a monster like that, Molly, and you don't name her Armageddon, or, uh, you know, I, I came up with, you know, here I have some notes that I wrote, but they didn't name her uh, Carnage or Abaddon yeah. or Lucifer or something. They named her Molly. So yeah. instantly we get the communication that Molly's our pet, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but, there, it, may be, it, it may be a callback to Molly O'Brien, the little girl from Deep Space Nine. Uh, so maybe I don't know if that was random or <laughs> but it's just like it gives you warmth but also mm -hmm. you know the fact that Molly um is she is a creature that we don't recognize yeah. she eats the bad guys so we like her <laughs> and then she romps so happily with her uh yeah, you know other transform friends when she gets back to where she mm -hmm. belongs so uh we love Molly but my my scientific question for you because I'm sure when you were watching it 
I'm just thinking, isn't Molly cute, you know? Yeah. But uh, when you're watching it, you're thinking, how does Molly compare to yeah. and contrast to creatures on Earth or worm-like creatures on Earth? So tell us about Molly. Sure, sure. So I, I, I made some notes about Molly as well. So I have six things that I thought that were interesting about Molly. First of all, it does seem like she's a sexual species because they talked about her mate when they went to that other planet. So okay. it implies that maybe that they reproduce together. I mean, it's a little unclear because mate could mean like, hey, mate. <laughs> it could mean something else too. I don't think that's what they meant though. <laughs> but, so that's one. Um, second, you know, Molly breathes and breathes apparently through lungs because we heard her actually scream with you know, presumably using something like vocal cords. So again, you know, she's called a trance worm. Now, if you think about it, like worms don't actually have lungs. They just sort of breathe through their, through their skin, like throughout. They don't have, she's not like a slug. So a slug has like a breathing hole. Oh, <laughs> it's okay. this whole These are all things thing. I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, no, I actually looked that up. I didn't know before yeah. that either. <laughs> so that was kind of cool. But, you know, again, she, she seems to have lungs kind of like us and like vertebrates on earth and you know, a lot of other animals like that. Uh, she had eight limbs that were all as flippers. So that was kind of interesting. Again, it's sort of different from what we tend to see here. Yeah, but it makes sense that they're flipper-like because she's aquatic. I mean, we saw her like jumping around happily in the water at the end. Uh, the tusks were kind of interesting. I like those crab-like legs that were like out, outside and even just inside her mouth. So it's something for bringing the food in. And presumably she eats large things like Andorians, I guess. Or, you, yeah. <laughs> or Michael Burnham for a moment. Or Michael Burnham for a little bit. Actually, I come back to that one. So it was interesting yeah. that I noticed she doesn't chew. And there's evidence she doesn't because if she chewed, Michael Burnham would have come out like pretty messed up, right? Right, right, right. <laughs> So it's, things were just kind of swallowed whole. Um, like a snake. Like a snake. Yeah, that's true. Now, one thought actually I had is I was wondering if she's a little bit more like a bird. Because the reason I'm asking oh. is because she was able to spit out Michael Burnham whole afterwards. And Michael was completely fine. But the other two guys who are still in there, <laughs> they didn't come out. So right. I was wondering if internally, maybe she has like a crop and a gizzard where the crop is just kind of like this big storage area. Maybe Michael was sitting there. Whereas the, the people who got in first were in the gizzard and they were getting ground up. Because again, if you're not chewing, you need some way to grind up the food. Uh, so maybe that was happening internally. She has like a gizzard that, that was grinding up the, the poor Andor. <laughs> thank God she was last in there. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> and still was in the crop area, I guess. Yeah. Now, making that up, of course, I don't, I don't really know what was happening there, but it's kind of cool. The last thing, and this is the most challenging part. I mean, it, she's really cool to see, but that size... That size is huge. Like, that was a yeah. very, very big beast. And I have a question for you that's related to that too. Now there's this principle in physics called the square cube rule that if you increase length, for example, by a factor of two, then you necessarily increase uh, square footage or surface area by a factor of four, right? Because like, if you, you know, just like you're, if you're, right. if you're doing two your squared. own multiplication, yeah. exactly. But you're increasing volume by a factor of eight Right. Oh, again, of course. Right? Yeah. And volume is going to be the, the biggest determinant of mass. So if you think about like how strong the muscles would have to be as you get bigger and bigger and bigger oh. and the skeletal structure, if she, if she has a skeletal structure, I'm not sure. It would have to be tremendously strong. Like titanium, you know. Right? Yeah. It would be really, really, really hard. And this is why, for example, when we look at ants, they seem so much smaller than us because you know, although they're tiny, like things that are bigger than them, it, it's not a big deal, right? Because you're looking at the cube of a tiny, tiny number, whereas as you get bigger and bigger, that cube gets bigger, you know, more and more gigantic. So that is so interesting. Right? <laughs> you know, it's so interesting listening to you because what fun, the things that you look for when yeah. you're watching, like, I, like while I was watching, I'm thinking, oh my God, that's profound that they called that place that Michael Burnham went to first. They called it Requiem. Yeah. How, how profound, you know, after this thing, the burn, this devastating, we don't know yet what it was, but um, that this place that everyone goes is called Requiem, which made me think of Mozart's Mozart's Requiem, which made me think oh, of great, death and then great glory coming from that. And I was like, God, that was really that. smart great. of them. Yeah, and I hadn't then, thought of that connection. That's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, and then they mention another place called Sanctuary, and uh, that's where they're trying to get to. So they're going from Requiem, this place of, you know, anyway, it just, the it might not be a direct connection, but the fact that the writers chose that, but those are the kinds of things, and we'll talk about it more later after we finish the science. Those are the kind of things that hit me, and it's so cool listening to you, and I learned because I didn't think about 
oh, you have to have lungs in order to scream, or a slug has an air hole, but a worm does not. And, yeah. you know, oh, that must be a sexually reproducing. And I have to confess, I didn't count the limbs on Molly. I didn't go, wow, she has eight. I had, and I had to freeze frame it and check. <laughs> so I was like, how many yeah, limbs does she have? <laughs> it's so interesting, you know, whereas... You know, yeah, that is cool. Watching, different viewpoint. I hadn't picked up on the record idea, but that's a beautiful point. Yeah. And I'm yeah. sure that I'm sure that was part of their thinking too. That's really cool. Yeah. Or it yeah, just came to them subconsciously, you know, yeah. like, uh, you know, the, the creative mind, just uh, things come to the creative mind from the totally. subconscious. And it, it totally makes sense. But if they were just trying to eke it out, like, yeah. I don't know, they might not have come up with that. But let me, um, let me ask you a question about Molly, if you yeah. don't mind. So, yeah. I heard in an interview with David Tomlinson, who normally mm -hmm. plays Linus, that um, in that scene with Molly, they actually had a pole in a bag. Oh, <laughs> That's nice. how the actors were orienting. Because of course there wasn't a real Molly there. That would have been amazing if they could do that. But um, how does that work as an actor? Did you have to deal with something like that? Or did you have other things which look completely different from the actor perspective as opposed to from the audience perspective? You know, that is such a good question because it's something that I live but when i'm watching discovery i forget about that just like everybody oh. and it feels like uh you know the actors are actually wrestling with molly but yes of course we have to imagine it all and um i think it's i think it's very interesting for the audience to know that so much of what you're seeing the actors react to in something as advanced on a production level as Discovery, you know, um, as Star Trek, so much of what the actors have to act is, uh, has to be formed in their head. So, you know, Michael and they all looked terrified to me and yet you're right, they were acting to something on a stick because of their eye line, you know, the thing, uh, it's very technical. They're, they all have to be looking at the same, they can't just have a general, <gasps> you know, reaction. They, <laughs> and all they, looking at slightly different ways. Right, place. they're all looking at slightly different places <laughs> and then they're trying to cut the film together and they're like, Dah! you know, so they have to have a point at which the, uh, the, you know, the actors look and then sometimes what they'll do is they'll play it back and they'll be like, ah, that wasn't high enough. Could you raise, could you raise that? Could somebody raise that stick a little higher? And then, okay, now just know that when we're doing this shot, Molly is eating, uh, you know, uh, David right now. And uh, <laughs> so people are like, ah, you know, that you have to think of it in your head. And I never had to uh, encounter a monster on Discovery when I did it, but I had to do what all of the actors on Discovery have to do every day on that bridge. And that is look out those windows <laughs> at um, basically the studio set. You're looking out the window at the warehouse you know, I mean, it's, and they have see wood beams a, or a piece of, you know, that you just see, cause it's a set. So you oh, see, yeah. um, and they put a piece of tape for everyone to look at. Cause of course, if I'm on stage left and somebody else is on stage, right. And somebody else is in the middle, we all have to be looking at that same piece of tape. And so, and we have to imagine it all in our heads, you know? So the, yeah, I think I, mentioned once before my best example of that from my experience i mean we all had a bunch of scenes where we were reacting to you know terrible things happening but in a um when when uh cornwall was very briefly the captain just very briefly um and they arrive my mind is going blank but they arrive at where they think is going to be the saving grace and oh, it's destroyed and yeah so i had to um I actually was really truly moved as I saw in my mind's eye, not with my eye eye, but in my mind's eye, I saw the destruction and I saw uh, that people I loved were gone and, and the, the extent of the destruction. So yeah, that that's a long scene. answer to those actors are doing it all the time and they really need to be applauded yeah. uh, for that. That was just for your context for anybody's watching us, the second to last episode of the first season. Right, right, yeah. right.
That's cool. So, um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, the actors need to be applauded. And then, of course, it's fun for the actors to watch the finished product totally. to see who they were actually fighting. Yeah, right. You know, you know it's <laughs> oh, kind, of, must, it's kind of fun. Oh, that's <laughs> how they now that's how the artists yeah. in the art department and the, you yeah. know, computer uh, CGI. Oh, that's what they've created. Exactly. How cool is that? And of course, it makes the actors look good too, because yeah. they're working together. So it's kind of cool. That's awesome. That's but awesome. Um, yeah, so that is a good question, especially for a series like that. Um, so the last thing you talked about. Um, oh, did we? Okay, so you did say how how Molly resembles and is different from yeah. um, things on Earth. The last thing is the insects. Now, my point of view. Uh, you corrected me once. I like calling scientists on Earth who study insects. I like calling them insectologists, which of course is not a word. Uh, they're entomologists. Very good. But for people like me, insectologists. I think that's a funny word. But for me, some insects can be so bizarre on Earth that it struck me as cool that they had that in the opening yeah. sequence. But um, I was like, well, okay, you know, I've seen some weird insects on Earth, so. Uh, I'll yeah. accept anything. They can go anywhere in their imaginations in space. Uh, you had a much more specific, you know, yeah, recognition well, of how it was different. So absolutely. Especially share that with us. Especially as, as someone who works on insects, I immediately picked up that, that one of them had eight legs rather than six. So, I mean, it would still count as an arthropod. It still has jointed legs, but it formally wouldn't be an insect, though, at least the one who was eating. So, oh. so that was kind of interesting. It was, it was like standing on three, but it had like two kind of sticking out the front. So that was interesting. But, oh, um, so it's more in the in the in the spider yeah, area. Yeah, it could be yeah, eight, eight, legs, eight or, legs. Yeah, or, absolutely. It could be an arachnid of some sort. Yeah, arachnid. Oh, what, yeah. what was interesting was how it's like its whole body opened up to eat that like dragonfly and things. Like, whoa. Okay, <laughs> that was kind of dramatic. So where, where is it? Get, yeah, that was kind of cool. <laughs> right, it was and then cool. You, was like, you, <laughs> and then like, where? how is it eating what it just swallowed? But, I guess, I've, all I could think of is that somehow it, it, it has like a big cavity in the middle and like a hinge and then just digestive juices then just flush out there and it just it sucks it into the top and bottom or something like that, I guess. It's got to keep its mouth closed really tight when it's right? doing that. So it doesn't <laughs> exactly, the digestive you know? juices go out. Yeah. <laughs> It was oh, pretty damn. dramatic. I was like, whoa, okay. <laughs> so like that insect, it has to say to its friends, you know, don't make me laugh after I've eaten. Right, you know, exactly. it's just going to make me spit everything out. <laughs> it's almost like a Pac-Man. I mean, the way, the way it, it is. Almost like, like, <laughs> it almost like a Pac-Man. It's like a Pac-Man. An insect Pac-Man. That's kind of cool. Um, I had a question for you on a Please. scientific level. So tell me biologically, scientifically, I mean, technologically, I guess, is the big answer. How does Michael as a human survive that crash. Oh. I mean, I know she had her, I know she had her suit on, but what would be your, as you're watching, what are you thinking? Yeah. The human body entering, you know, entering a new. Well, like all I can yeah. come up with is the suit must have really strong inertial dampeners <laughs> like the <What>? ship has. <laughs> Clearly yeah. it did. Yeah. She would have been just smeared. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but thank God we wouldn't have a season three. Yeah, no, that would have been a very short season. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it is hundreds of years in the future. So maybe we'll come up with I mean, that. We have those yeah. inertial dampeners. If you can stop from, you know, multiple factors of warp to, to or multiple times the speed of light just, to just stopping. The, and they know, all survive the, that. They all survive that. Exactly. So I assume whatever that technology was, was built into the Red Angel suit. Right. Okay. Okay, <laughs> good. I just thought I would throw that out there. No, please do. Please do. That's um, awesome. So let me ask you, what was your overall view on this episode, like either generally or specifically as referring to the cinematography and acting, things like that? Um, I loved this episode. I just was so floored. And the thing that's kind of fun for me, I'm in an interesting position of um, having worked on the show and stood on the ship, but I'm not involved now. I'm not in season three. So I can just have so much fun being a viewer. And it feels like it's even more fun because I could be like, Sonequa, that was fantastic. Like I can, <laughs> I can feel so, like I can love what actors do when I watch anything. But when you've when you actually know the people and have worked with them on the same project, I, I just, yeah. it's like a different kind of cheerleading rather than um, like Sonequa, for example, when she lands in the suit and she finally gets, um, she gets out of the suit and she finally realizes, you know, the suit tells her there are signs of life here. I mean, I get yeah. tingles <laughs> thinking of it. She just did, she went from 
you know, uh, you know, like, well, we did it. Th such joy and laughter, like hysterical, like, you know, slightly borderline where you would be if you had just gone through a war, you know, warp hole. Um, and then almost immediately after that, uh, she has to destroy, you know, the thing. I, I don't want to do any spoilers, but I, I, then she goes to a point where she's sobbing because she's alone. I mean, the range of human emotions. Then she goes to this requiem place and they spray whatever they spray on her. She I was <laughs> hilarious. So she showed us in the first, I didn't count the minutes, but however much time it takes, you know, the laughter, uh, uh, um, a different kind of laughter than when she's high, a laughter, a despair, a joy, a, a height of joy, a depth of despair, a hilarious, you know, woo-ness. I mean, <laughs> it was just fantastic. She did a great job. But also on a, um, just on a production level, like when the whole thing opened, what a what an amazing opening sequence with the classical music. And I was like, who is this guy at the beginning? And and then it came around at the end to who he was. And they, he was so good. He was. Um, it was inspirational. Yeah. He was, insp you know, the fact that he had waited there for 40 years. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that was a great storyline. And I love David. And I did look up the uh, pronunciation of David Ajala because I didn't know if it was uh, Ahala Ajala, but the forgive me if I mispronounce it, but I've heard other interviewers say Ajala. Okay. okay. So I'm, uh, I hope somebody will correct me if, <laughs> if I'm wrong, but how great is he? A yeah. great addition. I mean, yeah. um, and then he has his cat, Grouch, which is, but I just thought the, um, Old I'm just looking at my, <laughs> who you have, <laughs> but uh, the CG was amazing. I just thought thinking through the first episode, Every single department, you know, from the writing and the conception of it, um, the freedom they gave themselves to have that brilliant idea to go into the future so that now they can be attached to the whole canon, but have freedom to create new things without, you know, endangering different people's ideas of what, um, you know, what's faithful to the canon so far. So that was a brilliant idea to go into the future and uh, have the freedom to show us new things. So did the you, writing, the producing, did the you feel like artwork. you undercurrent of hope? There was so much of an undercurrent so of hope. hope. So yeah. hopeful, so yeah. hopeful. But that thin line that had held, yeah. you know, um, which is often the truth when we read human history, you know. Um, it's often just a few people who hang on to, uh, you know, the good, the hope. There, there's often just a few mm -hmm. and they have a profound, look at history, they have a profound effect on everything around them. So that was incredibly hopeful. I also want to do a shout out for Tunde, you know, the um, directing, because he did such a great, um, he balanced like in the, when they're running away in Requiem, he did such a good balance, like the greatest action films that we all love, you know, like with, you know, people making jokes, like in the middle of the world, you know, he did a great balance between the danger and the like, uh, you know, the tension, and then a little bit of humor. Yeah, agreed. You like know, with that, did, it's not been 30 seconds yet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or stop calling me rocket girl or whatever, yeah. you know, like, I mean, just all different things. He did, I mean, that's the writing, but he did a really great job. Um, you know, uh, I'm just looking on my notes because I, I just was, as I watched it, I had a pen, you know, pen and paper, old fashioned. And I was like, and it would be hilarious to read. So beautiful. CG is amazing. You know, who is the guy at the beginning? You know, so great. Yeah. Requiem is great. David Ajala, you know, Ajala is great. You know, I just wrote like in order. The portable transporters love that. Yeah. That actually, there's Great a callback to that. That showed up briefly in Star Trek Nemesis, which actually oh. is future related to Star Trek Discovery because it, it, that's set, you know, a couple hundred years after, or maybe about a hundred years. After Discovery, but after not Discovery. quite as far in the future. Yeah, exactly, okay. exactly. Because I remember those, Data though. had one of those and, and uh, that's how he oh. got over to the Romulan ship and things like oh, that. So. Okay, so you're, this is what, you're not, o you're not only our science guy, <laughs> but you're our Star Trek guy. Yeah, and you nerd. even have- the, <laughs> Nerd in all um, respects. <laughs> um, the, you, no, this is great because- uh, this is a perfect, um, you know, balance. Uh, so profound. I did write, you're right. So hopeful, beautiful, 
totally brought a tear to my eye. The end of it, I really, I mean, it really brought a tear to my eye. I just love that first episode. Um, Me too. Yeah. So that was basically my thoughts, but I'm so glad that now I know when I see a slug in my garden, (laughs) I'm going to be like, dude, where's your air hole? (laughs) (laughs) Where's your little pore? (laughs) Little pore. I won't see it. Um, And that worms don't have that. I would have in my head put them in the same class of slimy little insects in the garden. <laughs> so now I know I need to separate them. There you go. Uh, cool. Yeah. Well, That's thank really you. cool. Thank you for a wonderful discussion. And, thank you. And everybody who's watching, thank you for being here for a bio trekkie with Admiral and tune in next time. Bye. Good morning, folks. Bye. <laughs> I got to get better at that. Mm-hmm.